a presentation of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. In southern Arizona, along the Mexican border, is one of the most inhospitable and desolate places in North America. Here on close to a million acres of Sonoran Desert lies Cabeza Prieta National Wildlife Refuge, a place as wild and grand as any in North America. school teacher in Tucson and a refuge volunteer has been exploring the Sonoran Desert for more than 25 years. Bill has written extensively about the history of the region and devoted much of his life to learning about this fascinating ecosystem. The geology of the Cabeza Prieta is so spectacular because it is so young. Most of it began within the last 70 million years. This is the Basin and Range province, which means that most of the mountains are quite linear. And if you look at your map, you'll see them stretching from southeast to northwest. The mountains are of two different types. The granite mountains, which rise abruptly out of the desert floor, and also the basalt mountains, such as you will see over in the Growler Range, and also the top of Cabeza Prieta Peak, which is the black lava cap on the uh, blonde granite beneath. These mountains are separated by wide valleys which are filled in with uh, sediment from the eroded mountains. But the mountains themselves, because there's so little rainfall here, are very steep and very jagged and rugged coming directly out of the, the valley floors. As desolate and harsh as these bare mountains and valleys appear, People have hunted and gathered food here for thousands of years. There are places on the refuge that are sacred to the Native Americans who descended from these ancient people, many who still live in the surrounding area. Trails that were used for hundreds of years are still visible on the valley floors. Visitors to the refuge can travel on one of the more famous of these ancient routes. We're walking the El Camino del Diablo, the infamous Devil's Highway. It uh, is a segment of an old network of trails that prehistoric peoples used in this area to uh, crisscross their way between water holes, hunting grounds, campsites. You still see some of their trails out here, potsherds, stone tools, and even seashells that they brought back from the Gulf of California. They are long gone, but when the first European explorers came through this area, in 1540, Melchior Diaz, for example, he followed their trails. And Father Kino, in 1698, and several trips thereafter, he too took these same trails, guided by the Indians living here at the time. The road has always been very adventurous, severe, and risky. It took a lot of courage to come through the heat. For example, here's one grave of a passerby who did not survive the trip, and a number of them did not survive the trip. The cry of gold in 1848 brought a number of people to California by this route. They came unprepared. They came in summer to be the first ones at the gold strike and one observer reported as many as 400 graves along the stretch between Sonoida in Sonora and Yuma in Arizona along the Colorado River. Another observer reported a string of mummified livestock, broken wagons, bleached bones. The first motorized car to come through here was Rafael Pompelli in 1915. And if Raphael or even some of the 49ers or prehistoric people were to drive with you out here on this road, they would recognize the same landmarks, the same terrain, and they would be quite comfortable with you. 
You also would have the same problems that Raphael had. You would have broken radiators, punctured tires, bulky engines, and so he, like you, would have come prepared to drive this treacherous road. Being prepared means not only having the right equipment, but carrying at least a gallon of water per person per day while traveling on Cabeza. For early travelers, knowing the location of the desert water holes, or tinajas, Spanish for tank, was a matter of life or dying of thirst. This cryptic arrangement of stones, estimated to be more than a century old, points west towards Tinajas Altas, one of the few places where water was usually assured. Closer by through this pass, a canyon leads to a Tinaja that has seen much history. Several times a year, the rains will come coursing down this canyon and, and fill the tank, but then the hot sun thirsty tongues of animals may deplete it. If we were a prehistoric person or a historic traveler on the El Camino del Diablo coming by foot or by horse, this is one of the few water holes on the entire route. And if water is here, we are saved. If not, we have to march 20 more miles to Tanas Altas to find water. We, unlike some of the desert species, can't get along without water. So this place was a very important campsite for prehistoric people. Collectively, they were known as Amargosans, Patayans, Hohokams, and most recently, Yachirotams, also known as San Papago. They lived in this stark country. They thrived in this country. There were always very few of them, and they relied upon these natural cups of water in the granite or in the basalt. These water holes all had names and, and histories, and people would come into the canyon to camp, to gather food, to gather seeds from the mesquite beans, from the uh, Palo Verde trees, to use as their food. They would also, of course, hunt. Another important food source for early visitors to Cabeza Prieta were the desert bighorn sheep, who were hunted as they came down from their rocky crags to drink at the water holes. This noble animal, much admired for its desert savvy and magnificent horns, is today highly prized by big game trophy hunters. In fact, sportsmen were the prime movers behind early efforts to protect and preserve this region for the desert bighorn sheep. Another group who worked hard to preserve these natural resources were local Boy Scouts. In 1939, 860,000 acres of desert were set aside by presidential order as the Cabeza Prieta Game Range. Work was begun to develop water resources for bighorn sheep. Shortly thereafter, World War II broke out. This remote corner of Arizona that included the Cabeza Prieta Game Range became one of the nation's most important training grounds for combat pilots. Because this training required pilots to shoot at targets on the ground and those towed behind other planes, extensive sections of the refuge were closed to the public and staff much of the time. In 1976, Congress transferred jurisdiction of the game range to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the name was changed to the Cabeza Prieta National Wildlife Refuge. While the Air Force has retained the right to fly training missions over most of the refuge, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service manages the resources on the ground. In 1990, close to 95% of the refuge was officially designated a national wilderness the largest wilderness area on any national wildlife refuge in the lower 48 states. As part of the National Wilderness Preservation System, the American people are guaranteed that this remote and beautiful place will remain forever wild.